It's interesting, there's, a, there's a, a generation they call the movie brats, who are a little older than me. It's Francis Coppola and Marty Scorsese and Spielberg and Lucas and those guys, De Palma. They, we, what they have in common, what I, they're older than me, but what they have in common with me is we all grew up with television. And in the United States in the 50s and 60s especially, television, they would show old movies. I wanted to show the metamorphosis as something painful because in the old Wolfman movies, would sort of go like this and they'd do it dissolve, you know. And I asked Rick Baker, I gave Rick Baker, brilliant makeup guy, we made our first movie uh, together when I was 21 and he was 20, called Schlock. I had three successful movies, um, Kentucky Fried, Animal House, and the Blues Brothers, so I was able to make Werewolf finally, and they, I called Rick Baker and I said, hey, we're doing it. And he went, uh-oh, what? He says, I'm doing a movie now called The Howling. And I went, you fucker, what do you mean? Because he, the stuff he invented, what we call change o heads and everything, he invented for Werewolf and he, he, he gave them all to Joe Dante. I said, you bastard, so he quit. But Rob Bottin, who was his assistant, very brilliant, did the thing later and stuff. He finished The Howling for Joe. And the change head was just, you know, it's what Rob did too. It's it, where you see the, the physiognomy of the face start to stretch. When I had the chance to do it again in Thriller, <laughs> it's like Thriller, it's in the dark, there's big music, I keep cutting to the girls screaming, you know, I did all the cheats that you do because they work. In Werewolf, the demands on Rick Baker, and he's very smart, Rick. He said, okay, you have to storyboard this exactly, because I don't want to build anything that's not going to be used. And the promise I had to make to him years before, which I kept, was he needed the two actors, the boys who played Jack and David, at least six months before the start of principal photography, which was kind of scary, because it meant we had to hire David Naughton and Griffin Dunn before we had a Deal, which was, but it worked out. But so he made molds of their bodies, and then based on those molds, then they created the pieces for the metamorphosis. And he had actually figured it out years before. He scheduled the transformation the last week of shooting, so it meant that first of all we could cut a lot of the crew, and we'd finished all the other principals, so it was down to David Naughton. And it was a very strange week because we had, the set uh, was built up off the ground so the puppeteers could get underneath it and also David could get underneath it, you know. And uh, David and Rick and his guys showed up, I think at two in the morning to start the makeup and we showed up at, I think, eight in the morning and they were ready to shoot at nine. Then they went back and we waited for like four hours. And then they came back out. We did the second shot. Great. Then they went back. I think we got three shots the first day. And then, uh, and, but it was, but it was boarded for that. And we, and we finished it and it worked fine. Um, and it was the last, last thing of shooting. And it was, I think what made, made it work, one, well, David Naughton's performance. And two is the Sam Cooke music. It was very unorthodox use of music. I don't think it's a comedy, but because it's very funny, people like to label things. And people like, you know, when you mix genre, sometimes it makes people nervous, you know. It's like they like to put things on shelves, you know. This, this goes in this section and this goes. It, it, people like to categorize it. Um, but in fact, no, American Werewolf in London, I don't think it's a comedy at all. But I think it's very funny. I hope it's very funny. And my intention was to make it funny to increase how to make it more terrible, actually. Innocent Blood was more funny than, I mean, that was, that was kind of a comedy. But uh, American Werewolf was uh, quite unpleasant and un unhappy.
what the irony is when Joe made The Howling and then I made American Werewolf the same year was The Wolfen, Full Fine. Moon High, Teen Wolf. Well, there were like six werewolf movies. There hadn't been any in many years. Whenever you make a movie, you have challenges and you do, you figure out ways to do it. I mean, I think the best special effects are the ones you don't know are special effects. It's funny because people say, you don't like CG. And, and I think CG is overused. I'm bored with CG, but I think it's fantastic if used correctly. Talk about morphing. I, I, my story I talk about is technology. Uh, I went to school with a kid named John Whitney and Mark Whitney, these two boys I went to school with when I was 15. And their father was John Whitney Sr. He was a genius. He was a fine artist who basically invented what we now call computer-generated imagery. Um, he invented it as, a, as fine artworks. In 1971, I'd written Werewolf in 1969, and I'd been in Europe for a few years. When I came back, I went to meet Mr. Whitney down at Teledyne. And I said, basically, if a guy's going to turn into a werewolf, and I had Rick Baker do you know, the 23 steps of the evolution of the metamorphosis. Could you, Mr. Whitney, with a computer, it's called morphing now, but could you figure out, could you animate the in-between parts? It's 1971, and he said to me, absolutely, but not for at least 15, 20 years. And I said, why? He says, we don't have the computing power, but we will. And he showed me our missile defense system, this was the time of the Cold War, and he showed me underground by the airport, huge, with Marines with machine guns. It looked very much like Colossus the Forbin project, but he showed me a gigantic underground space, which had racks and racks of UNIVAC computers, those tall computers that had the tape going like that. Hundreds and hundreds of them stacked up. And he said, you know, see all this? This runs our uh, nuclear defense system. It's not enough power to do what you want. So he said, basically, no, forget it. So Rick Baker did it that way. All right. Many years later, uh, John Whitney Jr. made a movie called The Last Starfighter. But I went to John, and I, because I was doing this thing with Michael Jackson, Black and White, and I said, John, can you merge faces together? And he said, yeah, sure. And he sent me to a company called PDI. And it was very expensive, I remember. So I shot the live action stuff of the people singing. And I cut it together. And I said, here. And it took them, I think, eight weeks. It was like 30 guys on desktop computers. And they did it. And it's still pretty brilliant. And it was the first time, really, the world had seen that. Um, now, you can buy an app for your iPhone and do it on your iPhone. <laughs> My point is that the, the, the technology has advanced so fast that people really can do anything now. I was intrigued by the fact uh, Burke and Hare are real characters, and there have been a number of movies, I think 14 that I've found, of films based on Burke and Hare, all horror films. What, what I liked in the script was the idea of taking truly terrible people and making them romantic leading men. The idea of, of doing a romantic comedy out of such a grisly subject. Andy Serkis was actually at the last minute because we, I had cast David Tennant to be uh, William Hare. And unfortunately, David was double booked. He was put into a television pilot in the United States. And so we had to replace him. And I'm very pleased with Andy. Simon Pegg, um, I've always, I liked, I love Shaun of the Dead. And I really liked Hot Fuzz, too. And he was in a TV series called Spaced that I thought, he's very sympathetic. He has a real Hamish. He's very, very warm, sympathetic on screen. And it was important to me that Burke and Hare, I mean, they're murderers. And I do not disguise what they do. You see them do it. It's an interesting problem. How do you have them do these despicable things and still like them? What I told Simon... And Andy is, they were the evil Laurel and Hardy. I don't think they're immoral. I think they're worse. I think they're amoral.
I like making movies. I enjoy it. I've been very lucky that I don't have to, <laughs> but I'm very frustrated because the movies, I have many movies I want to make, but they're not necessarily safe commercial movies. So the kind of movies that are being financed now tend to be very... You can take the last reel of any Spider-Man, Superman, Iron Man, Thor, any of those movies, Avengers, and intercut them. No one would know. It's the same shit, you know? It's the same stuff. It's like 